steps really and truly like listing beneficiaries and transfers on debts or paid on debts is feels like the last priority on your list until it's not right? yeah on that urgent important matrix mm -hmm. it's important but it never really feels urgent mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so so happy you, you did it Ooh. hi everybody good to see you and good to see you again for a number of you most definitely you know um those of y'all who had us earlier, you know that we have the podcast, uh, the you know, podcast change. We have the the podcast where we talk about a lot of these things. We have a deep dive into this stuff called the Morbid Money Hour, mm -hmm. where we talk about all the stuff that you got to deal with when you die or when loved ones die. Yeah, and I just realized I think Deshaun was answering our question for the song that sums up how you feel today is "Happy." <laughs> oh yeah. That's great. I love it. I love it. I love it. That's good. Is that a Pharrell happy or is that a, like a don't worry be happy? I guess you just said happy. So it's a Pharrell one. <laughs> I love it. Thank you all today. Wait, 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 wait Pam, what's, what's the song? Oh. With, what about you? What's your, what's oh, your, yeah, we were just talking about this. For song? me, is Take Me Higher. Oh, yeah. Take by Me Fertile Higher. Fertile Ground. Fertile Ground, a great band out of Baltimore, happy Maryland. <laughs> So we're going to be talking about financial independence today, the five stages to your financial legacy. Independence is the one that's a little scary because it seems like far off. Even when we get to the independent yep. stage, it doesn't really feel real. Yep. So I think today I want you all to look at this and think about what's going to make it feel real for you. Because if we can plan, like, I know I, I feel like I'm a broken record at this point saying, if we plan for it, we're going to get it. But really, yes. if we plan for what it's going to feel like, to be independent, to feel like you're in the stage of financial independence, then you'll have something to reach for. Yeah, absolutely. So quick disclaimer, as always, um, please do not, Brunch and Budget is a registered investment advisor. So please do not construe anything that we tell you today as financial advice. It is for educational purposes only. Yes, the real for real is we don't know enough about your personal financial situation to give you accurate advice and we don't want to do you dirty. This fine print is here to protect you. You'll be able to see it when you look at the slides. Don't worry, we'll be sending the slides to everyone who signed up with their email address. Yes. And we'll be sending you the slides. You've got a slide that says we're sending the slides. <laughs> As always, we talk about the expectations and reality. The expectations when you get into your personal finance situation, you start dealing with financial literacy and become a financially literate. And now I'm financially literate and I can read and I can get all this mm -hmm. stuff together. And now I'm going to be a smart, successful person. And in reality, these tools are going to be available to you. And some of this information is going to be new to you, but life is a mess. And your financial life is, it's okay if it's a mess along with it. Remember to keep your eyes on the big black triangle and not worry as much about the silly string that gets us there. Now, today we're talking a lot about the self-advocacy stuff. And this is the stuff I think even more so than dealing with the morbid things and the transfers on death, I think this is the stuff that is really hard for us to reckon with because we don't even realize that we don't stick up for ourselves because we're yeah. too busy sticking up for everybody else around us, for your community, mm -hmm. for your family, for your friends, for your profession, for your art form, all these things, and we never put ourselves first. So when we're going through this whole workshop today, I want us to think about the ways in which we need to advocate for ourselves and the ways that we're not, because that's the stuff that gets us into the silly strength. Yep, exactly, exactly. So I am Pamela Capellet. I'm a certified financial planner and an accredited financial counselor. I'm the founder of Brunch and Budget, which is a full service financial planning firm and also the co-founder of Pockets Change, which is a hip hop and finance program for youth. I've been doing this since 2008, a really long time. I've been in this since wow. 2008. And uh, I've, I've seen a lot of stuff. I've seen a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my name is Dialect. I'm the director of pedagogy at Pockets Change. I have been an educator for almost 20 years now. I think well since 2003. So we've got some years in the game doing these things. It's really important for us to make sure that you have access to all the finance knowledge that you need to have to get the life that you want. Yes. Uh, we normally have DJ yeah. KK47 with us. She got waylaid by some technological difficulties. Her so laptop died, y'all. Like right before Whoa. she had just hit us up. So uh, I'm going to try to throw in some music in between. But remember, I'm not a DJ. We're trying here. But check out KK47. DJ KK47 does wonderful music and is a social worker. Does awesome stuff. Check out her work. And please feel free to book her. Brunch and budget, you know, talking about advocating for yourself, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you've told the story. If you watch the other videos about how brunch and budget started, people are trading advice for, for advice. food. Yeah. But it's this could have been just something where you helped out your friends. And how did it become a thing? 
Yeah, I mean, I think it really became a thing because I realized that people were afraid to talk about money and afraid to advocate for themselves around money. Like the reason how Brunch and Budget started was people were coming up to me like a little bit tipsy at parties and asking me finance questions, right? And I was like, maybe this isn't the setting for it. And, you know, when I suggested having brunch with someone, their shoulders dropped, their face changed. And they really felt like they had a safe place to talk about their finances. And I think even more than ever, it's important to advocate for yourself and figure out how to make yourself feel safe within that advocacy. So being able to first talk about it without having to have liquid courage, yeah. then being able to feel safe enough to talk about what's wrong, and then being able to feel brave enough to do something about it. To do that, it takes a whole team. This is the team of people that work with uh, Brunch and Budget. Actually, we got someone new who just came on the team. We'll have oh, to yeah, add them to the slide them. as well. All of these things lead up to personal finance being a revolutionary act. If you can align your spending with your values, prioritize your savings, get your credit and stuff together. If you can handle all of the things that they throw at us, the things mm -hmm. that are called adulting, the hoops that we have to jump through to make sure that we have some safety and stability and eventually a legacy for ourselves. Yes, exactly. So keep this in mind as we go through this because personal finance is designed to trip us up. It's designed mm -hmm. to make us fail. This whole system is designed for them to extract money from us. So when mm -hmm. you can figure out how to make the system work for you, then you can really feel empowered to advocate for not just yourself, but for your community. Yeah. And I think today really focusing on the advocating for yourself part of it, because figuring out where you haven't is bad hard. Yeah. I talk about it a lot in the workshops I do, because I think I'm still processing dealing with it from many years ago. Oh yeah, absolutely. So let's go through the five stages, a refresher for folks that have been here. And if you're new, these are the five financial stages. The first stage is financial safety. Mm -hmm. Then we have financial stability, financial sustainability. We did those three workshops already and you mm -hmm. can find recordings. Um, Angela will send recordings out. And then financial independence is what we're going to be talking about today. And then next week, our final workshop is on financial legacy. Legacy, legacy, legacy. And the worksheet, I'm going to put it in the chat, is here if you want to keep following along. We've been filling it out as we go. Again, if you haven't filled this out yet, remember to make a copy for yourself so you can start to make it fillable. Yes. These are financial stages that we just listed and the categories that we'll be going through in a moment. Yeah. So the first stage is financial safety. And what that looks like is you're unsure where your money's going, your bills feel out of control, your debt feels unmanageable, you have little to no savings, and you need to get a foundation. You need to figure out how to start. Yeah, the goals in this stage are to start saving regularly. In the first workshop that we, we talked about getting to that first $1,000 and keeping that $1,000 in there, then it's about organizing your bills, figuring out your credit and your debt, building habits, starting to learn financial terms and starting to advocate for yourself in this stage mm -hmm. and really asking for what you need and increasing income if needed. Then we talked about stability. Stability looks like you have a savings cushion, you have debt, but it's not increasing. You're learning more about investing, but you're still like one paycheck away from financial trouble, even if it's a big paycheck. Yeah, and in this second stage, it's all about maintaining what you built in the first stage, maintaining those habits, increasing the savings, increasing that savings floor, creating a debt pay down plan. So your debt isn't increasing anymore. Now let's talk about decreasing it, increasing your credit score, starting to build confidence in investments, putting together insurance and continuing to increase your income. And then last time we talked about sustainability, which looks like establishing your habits and your savings, making them concrete, comfortably auto paying your bills. Like, yeah, I'm chilling. I'm good with it. Yeah. You have debt still. Yeah, I probably have debt, but it's decreasing and you're using it to get leverage for the things you want, which includes increasing your retirement investments. Yep. As your debt increases, your savings increases, your investments increase. You're in a place you're able to save for significant goals at this stage. You're solidifying your estate plan, which we spent a lot of time talking about last time. How do you put together an estate plan? What does it look like, right? And you may be at the place where you're maxing out your retirement contributions. You're putting as much as you can into those retirement vehicles. Plan for the future so that we can get towards this stage, which is independence. 
And this looks like the mythical, magical working because you want to, not because you have to. This is the world where you don't really have credit card debt unless you've decided to use it for some specific, probably tax saving purpose. <laughs> and you have enough fun to enough save that you can fund extended time off from the work that you're doing. You can get those trips. This is when those yes boxes start to become really tangible. Yeah, this is when it's like, I have enough save so I can just quit my job. I have enough money i have enough income coming in that i can take a year off and figure out what i want to do next this is when we start talking about wealth wealth this is when you start talking about your money making money for you mm -hmm. it really kind of has to get to this stage before your money can make money for you because before then and this isn't a bad thing everybody acts like this is a bad thing before then your money is taking care of you which is great you want yeah. your money to take care of you, but you have to have the money fully taken care of you before the money is going to be able to go off on its own and start making money. Yeah, exactly. So the goals here are to start exploring other investment opportunities, determine what is truly enough for you, and also to make sure that your wealth is fully protected, again, through more advanced estate planning strategies. Mm -hmm. Next time, we'll be talking about legacy, which again, looks like your investments are funding your lifestyle. You're contributing significantly, not to your retirement plans, but to your community. Yeah. And you don't even need a credit you score. You don't even imagine that day where your credit score doesn't matter. That's how good you got it. it it's like, well, no, it's like when you, uh, when you graduated school and the permanent record just went away. <laughs> True. Permanent my behind. I guess it's still there somewhere if it's permanent. Somewhere, yeah. In a time capsule. <laughs> so the main goal here is to really formalize how you're going to show up for your family, how you're going to show up for your community now, and also beyond your lifetime. This is where the legacy planning really starts happening through estate planning, through philanthropy, through your investments. Mm -hmm. So at the end of saying this part, we always ask folks to ask themselves what they're doing here. Why yeah. are you here? Yeah. Why are you dealing with these systems? What do you want out of them? These systems that deal in wealth inequality, these systems that discriminate against you, these, sim these systems that use capitalism to extract wealth from people and take advantage of other folks. You're wrapped up in them. You're being taken advantage of by them and you are forced to interact with them if you don't just run off. Yes. And this leads directly into what your relationship with money is, right? In terms of understanding what your relationship is with money, with imposter syndrome, dealing with, you know, not feeling like you belong in the room, which these systems have been designed to make us feel that way, right? Your relationship with what your habits are, are your habits helping you survive? Or are they helping you thrive? Dealing with, you know, hustle culture, burnout culture, the idea of having to work twice as hard to get half as much, and also any internalized depression that you have, again, because of these systems. Even just like stuff like imposter syndrome, I... I can't say too much on this because I didn't read up enough, but I was just finding out how imposter syndrome, the term, was created by folks who were just trying to rationalize the oppression that's going on and saying that it's on you rather than being put on you. So a lot of these yeah. things that we have in our hearts are things that are put on us. And that has a big effect on our finances. We talk a lot about our feelings. Folks are like, why does it matter about the feeling? You just need to know the math. The math is nothing. We can get calculators for that. But if we are not in control of our feelings, our feelings will be in control of our wallets, I swear. Yes. By the moon and the stars in the sky. Let's get going. Yes. So... <laughs> Also, things just don't go away. Oh, yes. Like the grind. The grind. That's a really, oh that's a really good and point. And glorifying the grind. Like, nah, let's glorify the rest. So, yeah, speaking of which, so we've got this political cartoon that's talking about, so um, we need to dig into the roots of these systems and the stuff that they do to us. And I don't know if you've ever heard of dead peasants insurance. It's a thing that's happened in your lifetime. It's happening mm -hmm. now and today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dead peasants insurance is this thing where companies take insurance out on you, the worker. And if you die, then the money doesn't get paid out to your family. It gets paid out to them. And if that sounds horrifying, it's even worse when you learn that this is an unbroken line of practice that comes from enslaved Africans. Uh, Nautilus, which is now known as New York Life, mm -hmm. part of their portfolio, they even have another website. There was only a small part There's of their portfolio. Part of but part of their portfolio was ensuring the bodies of enslaved Africans. And that same practice continues today to people of all races. They've opened it up to everybody else and made it, I guess, diverse. Yes. And dead peasants insurance, they don't do it that much anymore. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of companies did it. Hundreds of Hundreds. huge corporations literally took like, out. They got Walmart in there, but like half the banks, you know, were in that real. list too. 
They literally took out insurance policies and they got the payout. And the reason why they stopped doing it, not because it was made illegal. Or not because because they felt like some compunction in their morals. It just stopped being profitable after a while. And they're like, oh, we're not going to do it anymore. Yeah. So we need to understand where these things come from so that we can be real about the decisions we make in these systems. All those things being said, I'm still interacting with these systems. Mm -hmm. And we still think that these are the best ways for you to get what you need. Again, this is how these are revolutionary acts. These folks are already oppressing us. So we need to take what we can get so we can make the decisions we want. All that being said, for those of us who are coming back, I would like you to still take this money quiz. For those of us who are new, I would like you to take this quiz for the first time. People are like, oh, I got it already. I'm ready. We're going to be talking a little bit about how this deals with negotiations in a second. So the quiz goes like this. It's just these two questions. Which phrase do you relate to more? A, I think more about what I have in my bank now. It's not real until it's in my account. Or B, I'm usually spending the next check in my head before it hits my account. And two, which phrase do you relate to more? A, I tend to plan ahead. Or B, I tend to deal with things as they come. We'll give you like 30 seconds to write them out. Yes, please share your answers in the chat. Thank you, everybody. So we're going to move on to our money personalities. These are our money personalities. This is not something that we invented, but we put together our own version of it. And check this out. So what I think we should do today, because you can check some of the earlier videos for us to give you the full breakdown of these money personalities, I want to talk a little bit more today about what this means in terms of self-advocacy. Yes, I love that, because we're going to be really digging into earning more money and negotiating and all of those things later in the workshop. So I love that idea. If you haven't been here before, money personalities are basically a way to figure out what your relationship with money is and also what your money tendencies are. So there's no good or bad money personality. There's also only four of them. That's the other good news is you are not alone in terms of how you deal with your money and what your relationship with it is. There's no wrong personality. You don't need to switch from one to the other. These are just your tendencies, your feelings, that nagging thing that's on your shoulder every time you make a purchase or try to save money. Yes, exactly. And so if you answered a for one and a for two you might be a complicator Mm -hmm. i'm a complicator everybody hello um it looks like angela realized actually she's a complicator too (laughs) and so the thing about complicators is we stress out about money to the point where we feel like we have to make everything a priority we're trying to figure out how to get the estate plan going and get our savings account and get our bank accounts in order and pay down our debt and we get the long list of things to do and we feel like we have to do them all right now and the reality is that we don't and i think with complicators one of the things that i've learned as a complicator is that i have to figure out how to prioritize things and what to really let go of Mm -hmm. And the thing with complicators when it comes to advocating for ourselves, listen, my mom was a complicator too. I saw her check the grocery store receipt every time we went to the checkout and she would call a manager in when they were a 10 cents off y'all, 10 cents off. That is how much she went into advocating for herself for those small things. But the thing is that I've learned too as a complicator is I can advocate for myself with the small things But sometimes I have a harder time advocating for myself with the big things because I have a hard time differentiating between what is big and what is small. This is what you're saying. Everything feels big. Everything Mm -hmm. feels important. My mom probably could have let that 10 cents go. I probably could have gotten the second best dishwasher instead of the number one best dishwasher. And that would have been all right. And I think with complicators, the thing to really understand is where are you actually putting your energy into when it comes to advocating for yourself? Are you ta- are you spending the energy advocating for the things that really are important and really matter to you? Yeah, and I'd like to ask for our complicators, when you feel that need to start fighting for that 10 cent, I want you to ask yourself what you're really afraid of losing. Is it the 10 cents or is it some measure of control? Mm -hmm. If you answered A for one and B for two, you might be a contemplator and they're the other end of the spectrum, right? Mm -hmm. Well, where the complicator makes everything a priority and it's hard to tell what the priority is. It's similarly hard for the contemplator to tell what the priority is because nothing is a priority. The contemplator doesn't want to deal with any of that. They would rather just go take a walk, hang out with their friends, anything, but deal with the money that's in their head. But 
they'd rather just improv it, let it happen when it comes to them. One of the things that I think is really important for contemplators to do in terms of advocating for themselves is have their stuff together. One thing that uh, mm -hmm. contemplators don't have is the paperwork. Contemplators often have it all up in your head. And I'm not saying that you're not really smart people, contemplators. You often are very bright and very good at memorizing things and having these dots and squares, but you're not taking it seriously, which means that you don't have your paperwork, which means that when you go to the place that wants all of the official documents, you're going to need another day because when you get to the front of the line, they say you don't have the stuff. So then you go to the back of the line. Now you've wasted a day. Now you're not going to do it for six weeks. It always feels like it will be important when it's important. But if you can set all of your paperwork aside for the time when you really need to do it, then you'll be able to knock it out once and not have to take six weeks to do something that should have taken a day. Yes, I love that. And if you answered B for one and A for two, you might be a paper chaser. Mm. And the thing about paper chasers is you are really good at making the money. You're really good at figuring out how the money's gonna come in, when it's gonna come in. You're great at taking that second, third, fourth, fifth job even sometimes to make sure that you hit those short-term goals. But the thing is that because you're so focused on the short-term, the long-term tends to fall by the wayside. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we ask paper chasers to do is to really figure out how to prioritize savings. When it comes to advocating for yourself, you know how to play the game. You know how to do the balance transfers. You know how to get the extra gig. You know how to get the extra paycheck, whatever it is. But really, we need you to put some of that energy into back into yourself and making sure that when those extra gigs don't come or when the extra income doesn't come, that you're still taken care of. And that practically translates into having a savings account. Paper chasers tend to, because you're so good at making the money, tend to have a hard time keeping it because you're like, oh, I know when the next check is coming, right? And so- we ask you to think of your savings as another stream of income and use that so you can have leverage to advocate for yourself when you need to. And if you answered B for one and B for two, you might be a money monk. And I'm a money monk as well. A lot of creatives, a lot of educators are money monks. And so to talk about money monks and advocacy, we tend to be very passionate and care a lot about our community, our yeah. art form, our industry, wh whatever it is that we've decided is important to us. But we have a hard time advocating for ourselves because we are too busy thinking that we should advocate for the community at large. Yeah. And I think a lot of times this comes from the lessons we get. We kind of buried the lead on this a little bit, but a lot of times these money personalities are reactions to the stimuli around us and plenty of times trauma as well. I remember Mama Lek used to tell me, not to send back a burger at a restaurant because if I did, they would probably spit in my food. Uh, what she was teaching me wasn't uh, food safety, it was smallness. Mm. It was to be out of the way, to be unnoticed because if you get noticed, then you might get in trouble. Now, this is something that comes from poor folks of all black backgrounds, and it also comes from being Black American. We have been forced many times to be small in situations or else our lives are in physical danger. Whenever you see Black Americans talking about, well, we need to be dressed a certain way, we need to be clean a certain way, it's not just because we like to look fly or whatever the media wants to say, but it's an entire set of generations upon generations know that our lives are in danger if we stood out in these ways, if we weren't clean like it was like it was said to be clean we could be taken off the streets and put into work camps if we weren't all together then we could be taken away from our families so we hide we're small i was taught to be small i was taught not to advocate for myself because if i spoke up i would be taken out it's taken years upon years for me to unlearn that as a money monk the thing that i've learned is if i don't stick up for myself then i'm not sticking up for my community because I'm a member of my community. And it's not just about putting your own oxygen mask on first. It's about straight up being an example for everybody else who cares about whatever community art form thing that you're doing, just like you do. Because if I take lesser rates, so will they. Mm -hmm. If I take harassment and punishment, so will they. If I stand up, they will too. Easy as that. Oof. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, yes, yes. So yes. I want to take a moment. We've been talking a lot and we're going to give you a moment to share in chat. Now, we've asked this of our people who've been here before, what you feel that you need to get to the road to financial legacy. Those of y'all who are brand new, 
feel free to just say something like income, opportunities, a plan. Those of you who've been here, those of y'all who've been here a couple of times, especially, I would love to hear some details yeah. about what y'all got going on and how you're feeling. I want to know some details about how you are going to get there, if you've already got some thoughts, or if you're already working on it. Let's do that. Let me play some of these songs. We'll come back in about two minutes. Got a DJ over here. Be back. Say. 738. All right, we'll come back now. Thanks y'all for sharing. I noticed a couple of uh, specifics in there. I saw a plan, which is like, definitely we need to get a plan mm -hmm. together. But I dig uh, investments, Roth IRA, I need more long-term thinking. And you know, just thinking about thinking in long-term is a big victory. Realizing that when you're talking about a long-term plan, you don't mean five years, you mean 20 years. Yeah, you mean like what happens like when, you're, when your family inherits your money, things like that. And so when, as we like dive into the financial independence stage, really thinking about what it takes to get there. And the, the last three workshops that we did really, I think like set you up for like, okay, so first the savings and then, you know, and then the investing and then the estate plan, like how does it all fit together? Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to the money topics or the money categories, these are the topics to master at each stage. The first one is earn. Mm -hmm. So understanding your income, your taxes, and your career. The second stage is, or the second money topic is spend. And that's your bills, your discretionary spending, the money that's going out, basically. The earn is the money going in, spend is the money mm -hmm. going out. Save is really understanding what your savings milestones are, starting from that first thousand dollars all the way to big, hairy, audacious goals. Well, and, and again, um, as folks are saying in the chat, just letting money sit around is not saving. Saving is an active thing. So we have to make an active plan for them. Yes, exactly. It's okay that the money is sitting in a savings account if you know what it's for, right? Mm -hmm. The other thing is, the other topic is borrow. So understanding your credit and debt. We actually did a workshop series with Brookdale last year mm -hmm. on how to not be a broke college student. And one of the big focuses was on credit and debt. And the other workshop that we did was around investing. And so the other big money topic is investing stocks, bonds, and real estate. And then the sixth money topic is protect, which is insurance and estate planning. We talked a lot about estate planning in the mm -hmm. last workshop. Mm -hmm. All right. So this is what the fully filled out sheet looks like. And when you look at the earn category, we're sharing that one today. Yes. So earn in financial safety means I understand my income and my taxes, not like I'm doing great with them, but I get what's going on. Yeah, I can look at the chart. You understand the relationship between them. You know the difference between gross and net income. You know what's being taken out of your paycheck. You know how much your tax, how much, how many taxes are being charged. Ooh, ooh, ooh. For lots of folks who yeah. don't know this, you know how much money you make. Yeah. You'll, you'll be amazed how many people have no idea how much money they make. That's yeah. been me for a lot of years. Yeah. Like what is your salary? What is your actual income for the year? 
So financial stability is um, increasing my income and optimizing my taxes. Yeah. So you have an understanding of your taxes to the point where you know what kind of deductions you can take, what kind of purchases to make to lower your taxes, and you're increasing your income. You're consistently asking for raises and getting them. You maybe have a second source of income. You're figuring out how to grow that income. So when we get to financial sustainability, then you have surpassed Mick Jagger and you have found... <laughs> satisfaction in your career yes yes <laughs> i hope he has i hope he it's does one day it's a song. i know the songs <laughs> i know songs <laughs> so in terms of finding satisfaction in your career that could be you being happy where you are that could be you figuring out that you're done climbing whatever ladder you're trying to climb or are you realizing like hey i need to pivot and i'm gonna try something new right mm. Yeah, this is that time. Then we have financial independence where you're choosing how to earn money and spend time rather than chasing the money and the situation that seems the best for you. Yes, exactly. And then in financial legacy, this is really where your money is making you money. Money is making money, making money, making money. So it will take like one minute now. And um, why don't you tell us what stage you think you're at in the earn row? Don't think too hard about it. So I'm going to just give you uh, a minute. It is 742. Let's come back at 43. Mm -mm 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 -mm. <laughs> I'm going to pull it up. Mm -mm 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 -mm. So we flipped it back to slide. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Oh, yeah. Yes, let us know what stage you're at in the earn category. Sustainability, that's great. Okay. Looking pretty good, y'all. Seeing some safety, seeing some sustainability, seeing a little bit of independence mixed with legacy. That's what's up. Yeah. Like, like to see all of those things. Earn is such an interesting one for me because earn, like it, it, it irregardless of wealth, mm -hmm. right? So whether or not you have the wealth to back this stuff up and make the rest of these things work, earn is this thing that like you can constantly have moving. Yes. Yes, I understand my income, another safety one. That's great. Yes. I love it. I love it. And the thing is that um, when it comes to earning, when it comes to all of these things, you can be in different stages within the category. So you mm -hmm. can be in sustainability and earn and stability and protect and safety and stage. We have plenty of clients who are like in sustainability and earn and safety in saving, for instance. That makes sense because you can be earning and not really saving like that. Yes. So earning financial independence, choosing how to earn money and spend time. So what is that? What, what the, <laughs> I know. How, do you, how, how do you even do that? Woo, yes. How do you even do that? So the goal here is to have control over how you earn income, what you charge, what work you do, how much you work, if and how much time you take off, which is a good great place to be mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. and the challenge really is to figure out how much is enough for you again we've said in in terms of getting through the stages the way to get through the stages faster in a sense is to really understand how much is enough right because you could technically keep earning more and more and more and more money but is that actually what you want is that getting you to financial independence or is that chaining you to having to like work at a job or work at this income so that you can fund your lifestyle. You know how you know that 
most folks don't know what enough is. How? If you've been in an airport, especially a, a foreign airport where you've gone to another country, right? How many times my people who've been in airports in foreign countries, you get out of the airport and there is a giant billboard of a famous actor, like a really big, like <laughs> multi-million per movie famous actor doing some watch or chocolate or some right. sort of ad, like the type of thing that you thought they would have done as a rookie actor before they became a huge star. And you're like, what are they doing? Doing the chocolate Don't they have ad? enough money? But they don't realize they have enough. I mean, hey, maybe there's some other stuff where they're doing a favor for somebody. But it, a lot of times people are doing these things because as you continue to make more and more, you're like, I need to keep making more and more. Yeah. Well, that's what am I going to do? That's a stock market thing, right? We're like, yeah. you can't even just be a good business. It has to be making more. Yeah, I always say they must have needed to pay some bills. For real, right? right? And that's what it feels like. But oftentimes, trust me, they're fine. They're, they're doing good <laughs> off those multi-million dollar deals. Yeah, so when you figure out how much you actually need to make, then you have way more options in terms of choosing how to earn your money and how to spend your time. This goes back to the thing that I was saying earlier about, about making a plan for it. And yeah. it seems boring and mundane to not shoot for the moon, but actually shoot for the target that you're looking for instead. Yeah, have a target. De Niro needs to pay for that yacht market. <laughs> right? I'm saying, Bruce right? like, what are you doing over there, Rob? <laughs> so, so to talk about that, let's get real for real and practical because we're not, most of us aren't making De Niro money. Actually, I don't know. Yes, so we're are. all across the map in terms of what stage we're in when it comes to earn. So if you haven't asked for a raise recently, if you've never asked for a raise, here's where to start. These are the steps. We've done two podcast episodes on this. We've done, we've posted stuff on Instagram about this, especially because it's annual review season, y'all. April, springtime is the time to ask for a raise. Well, and I guess like uh, pursuant to what we were saying earlier, like you really do have to know what you want. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, all the money, no, no boss is going to be like, yes, all the money. Cause yeah, you could be like, oh, I, if I could make all the money, but you want to know how much you need to live the life that you're trying to live now and in the future. Yeah. So the first thing is you don't have to wait until annual review season to ask for a raise. That's usually when employees get their cost of living increased, right? Where you're like, oh, we're going to bump up your salary two to 3% to keep up with inflation or hopefully five to 7% right now with where inflation is at. But you don't have to wait until that time to start having this conversation. In fact, we recommend that you have a pre-raise talk with your boss. Mm -hmm. And what that means is you just start inquiring like, hey, I feel like that I'm doing more. I feel like that I could do more here. These are the things I'm interested in. What would it take for me to get to the point where I get a promotion or a raise? So it's just like an informational session with your boss to figure out like, hey, what do I, what more do I need to be doing to put myself in a position to get there? Yeah, you know, I, I have a question for you that I feel like it's on folks' mind. When you're talking about these kind of things and doing these pre-raise kind of talks, how direct should you be? Like, is this mm. the kind of situation where you're like, you want a certain birthday present from your spouse <laughs> and you're like, hey, you know, those, the, the shoes look really nice. They, I think they would look good on me. They, they match my blazer, right? And then you keep it moving or like, should you, uh, I'm just saying like, should you be outright stating it with your you're boss? Hate this answer. It depends. You're the one that knows your relationship with your boss. Mm -hmm. It may even be helpful to figure out what your boss's money personality is mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. actually see how to approach the conversation because you know, your boss, you know, if you can be direct with your boss or not. Right. I knew that I could be semi-direct with my boss. I knew that I could talk about wanting to do more and wanting to be more involved in more high level things and wanting to be more involved in, you know, higher level conversations and what would it take for me to get in the room? So I didn't mention money at all, but I did talk about how I wanted to level up, right? Yeah, there, I'm sorry. There's no simple formula for asking for a raise. The most important thing is know who you're talking to. Yes, exactly. And also when you have that pre-raise talk, now it's time to start gathering evidence, right? Start making your case, start keeping track of your accomplishments, start keeping track of the times where you went above and beyond so you can figure out how to ease into that conversation about what do you think your next role can be, right? Mm -hmm. Like when I started asking for my raise at my first job, I realized that I might have to 
create a position for myself. The mm-hmm. position that I wanted didn't exist. I was an operations assistant and I wanted to be in more of an associate type role, right? And get asked to help make decisions and be in that position to like lead in certain situations. And so figuring out what your next role will be, whether it's like laid out in your company as a career path or whether you see a gap in terms of what people need at the company or what your team needs at the company. And you say, I can fill that gap and this is how. The next thing is, how much do you ask for, right? It's time to start doing your research on what your market rate is for what your current role is Mm -hmm. and what you think your next role will be. There are lots of resources to do that. Places like glassdoor.com, places like um, salary.com. I'm trying to think of other ones that I've seen. Um, Salary.com and glassdoor.com are probably the the biggest ones. The thing I love about glassdoor.com is it's crowdsourced. Mm -hmm. So they're real people in those positions who are reporting their salaries. And then you have to prepare for a no or potentially prepare for looking for a new job. Mm -hmm. If you keep getting that no, right, then it's going to be about, okay, maybe they don't actually value me at this company in the way that I need to be valued. And you might need to find a new job. Uh, specific uh, focus on the, in the way I need to be valued. It's not like they don't like you. It's yeah. not like they don't appreciate you. It may be that they value you, but when you set the rate and the things that you need enough for yourself, if they're not able to match it, even if they're really nice people, it might be time to move on. Yeah. Now, when it comes to this negotiating stuff, uh, there are a lot of curveballs and fastballs. So I'm mm-hmm. going to throw one at you. Throw Pam, one at me. Since I know this is your whole thing. Throw it. So what if I want to do all this stuff, but... I don't actually talk to my boss that much on a day-to-day basis where it feels comfortable for me to just like bring stuff up. We mostly only talk like I get orders or like I get the annual review, but otherwise, you know, I'm getting it through intermediaries or on emails. Interesting. How do I find those inroads to be able to make those conversations happen if I don't have it like that? That's a really great question. I mean, I feel like if you're in a situation where that's the case, then it's the conversation is going to be much more formal. You're probably going to have to set a meeting up with your boss that you don't normally have, right? Like I had weekly meetings with my boss. It was easy to be like, let me bring this up in a weekly meeting. But if you don't have that situation with your boss, then it's going to feel more formal. And you're probably going to feel like you have to be a little bit more prepared in terms of that talk. I think too, this could be a really good opportunity to figure out how to have more interaction, more communication with your boss from the point where you're ready to ask for a raise all the way up until the point where you get it. Yeah, make a plan for the plan that you're making. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So speaking of that, we have three Ps for you when it comes to actually asking for the raise. And really this is all about advocating for yourself and having some agency in this process. I know one of the biggest mistakes that I made, even when it came to asking for a promotion is, I forgot to come up with the amount of money that I wanted to make. Mm -hmm. They just told it to me. And I said, yes, I got the promotion, but I didn't figure out how much more I needed to actually ask for. Mm -hmm. And that was my early career. The whole time was I kept getting promoted. And let me tell you, by the time I left my first job, I found out that the person who had started three months before me came in making more money than I was making when I left. Yo, I can't tell you how many times I've heard stories of and had lived experiences of getting proactively promoted to avoid eventually having to pay me a lot. Yep. Mm. Yep, exactly. So really the first P is plant. Starting the seat early with your boss. If you don't have the, uh, a close relationship with your boss like Dialect was describing, figure out how to formally have the pre-raised conversation, right? And also figure out how you can open those lines of communication with your boss now. So start talking about getting a raise and how you want to get it before you actually ask for one. Mm -hmm. The next thing is to really plan, keeping track of all your accomplishments, actually doing a good job, showing that you are excited and that you do want to be a team player here. Yeah, again, the specific focus, keep track of the stuff that you do. Find a place. You're already doing it, y'all. Yeah, you're doing it for them, but do it for yourself so that you have access to it and can show them anytime. Do it digitally, do it physically. I'd say do it digitally because you're going to need to reproduce it. Yes. 
and then prepare. So this means practicing, doing mock conversations with friends, talking to other coworkers and seeing if they're willing to share, you know, how they got raises or how they got promotions. You know, in this series, we haven't talked very much about the whole money buddy aspect of things. And one of the biggest ways that people keep money out of our pockets is by teaching us not to talk to each other about it. We often have trouble advocating for ourselves, but like I said earlier, we'll advocate for our people. We'll yeah. advocate for our friends and our family. So especially as we're first starting to figure this stuff out, please, we implore you to share with your peoples and advocate for each other. Yeah. Do these mock interviews, do these conversations, Heck, have them on the line with you when you make calls. Yeah, exactly. And I love this um, in the chat. Keep a running Google Doc with what you do and any outcomes. Mm -hmm. Outcomes are huge, right? I love that. What are the results that you've already delivered? And then what are you going to deliver next? So I will tell you, if you've never done this before, this is going to be uncomfortable the first time you ever do it. Advocating for yourself is not easy, but it does get easier along the way. Every time you ask for the next promotion or that next raise, you've done it before and you survived through it. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's less that it's easy and it's more like you've built up the muscle. Yeah. So through the repetition, you're able to do it, even though it still feels uncomfortable. Because I got to say, there are certain ways of advocating for myself that without having developed the muscle as, as a youngster, mm -hmm. it still feels icky and weird for me to do. Yeah. But I've just done it more so I can do it again. Yeah, exactly. I love that distinction. So how do you prepare for a no? And what does that look like? So a no could be no, or it could be less than you asked for, right? You mm -hmm. asked for a 15% raise, you got a 10% raise, or it could be, we just don't have the budget for it. Whatever mm -hmm. that looks like is how do you pivot? One, can you get a one-time bonus instead of a permanent salary raise? Mm -hmm. Is there a way to build in a bonus into your income at the company? Are there any other benefits like stock options, flexible work hours, working from home? Are there other things, more vacation days? Are there other things you can ask for at this time outside of more dollars, right? That will also be essentially like a monetary or non-monetary exchange. Um, if you still get a no, ask for what it would take to get that raise in the next three to six months. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you have the conversation with your boss over the next three to six months and say, hey, I did all of these things that you asked, figure out what you need to accomplish. And if you keep feeling like you're running against a wall, it's probably time to start looking for a new job. Another way that you know that you should start looking for a new job, and I think this is kind of definite, if they don't want to have these conversations with you. Yeah. If you come to them and say, hey, what would it take for me to get this phrase in the next three to six months? And they're like, yeah, I don't know. Mind you, this might not be personal. Maybe they're dealing with some management stuff, so it's difficult for them and they can't even wrap their brain around it. That's also a sign. Yeah. It's that, just time to leave the company, maybe. That being said, they are not actively valuing the work that you're doing in the way that you need to. Yeah. And thus you have to make some ideas about it. And this is all way easier, way easier to say than to do, which is, again, while we're talking about making these plans and making them as far in advance as possible so that you can create some runway and figure out where these opportunities lie. Yes. Yeah. But in today's job market, the way that people have truly increased their income is realizing they weren't going to get the raise mm -hmm. that they were supposed to get at their job and getting a new one. You can tell this because of all the articles out there complaining about these kids hopping around from job to job too much. Yeah. It's no like, loyalty. Uh, yeah. <laughs> has nothing to do with, has nothing to do with us, has everything to do with the companies. What happened to crushing your soul and you being loyal anyway? Yes, the great resignation for, for, real. Real, for real. The great resignation is really happening right now. I have so many clients who have quit their jobs, who, um, who are planning to quit their jobs. Our new financial planner at Brunch and Budget was at Vanguard for 10 years and was like, I can't do this anymore. So it's happening right now. And it's a really great time to do it. So switching jobs... The big no-no is to threaten or imply to leave if you don't get what you want. Uh, we are, we are, we're new parents. We have a, <laughs> a two-year-old. And one of the things that we've learned, it's, this is just a human thing. And I think it's good. Practice stuff on two-year-olds if you have them around because they are indicators that two-year-olds grow up into adults. And when you threaten the two-year-old, give an ultimatum, it never goes it the way never that works. never goes the way that you want. It never works. Oh my God, I've tried it. 
<laughs> well, also, I mean, it's just not a, a comfortable relationship to be like, oh, I'm going to threaten you to get what I want. Then there's always tension, always stress. And in the long run, they're going to not value you or think that you, you don't value them and you will part. Yes, exactly. So if you do feel like you're running up against a wall, it is probably time to start looking. Job switchers tend to have more leverage. And, um, you know, this, I, I don't think we updated this number since the Great Resignation because the Great Resignation is still happening. Um, but the thing is that you can increase your wages by switching jobs more than if you stayed where you were. I'm hoping that a lot of companies are changing that because they are losing really high quality uh, employees mm -hmm. to people just realizing like, hey, I don't have to do this anymore. So yeah, uh, one of the, our tips that we always remind folks, getting no is a good thing. When folks don't value the stuff that you're doing, that means that you can easily and quickly push them away and go towards the people who actually do want the stuff that you do. Yes. So the art of negotiating. So if you're in a position where you have some freelance income or if you're freelancing or if you're a business owner who sets rates, the thing to remember is two numbers, your standard rate and your floor rate, right? So you have a standard rate that you share with everyone. You won't always get this rate, but it's important for clients to know what it is. And then what is that floor rate that you won't go below? And this is where the negotiating room really is, is between the floor rate and the standard rate. If you are giving an organization or a client a discount, make sure they know it, put on your invoice. It is a discount. You're not just being flexible. Yeah. So how to consistently raise your rate. So this is where it gets a little weird because you need to give yourself some arbitrary rules for how to raise your rates. And what I mean by that is, just, just, just make it up. Just make it up. Exactly. It, it, yeah. It, if, in case it feels weird to just make it up, remember that all rates are just made up. Yeah. If you're freelancing and you, and you haven't raised your rates with your clients, that means you haven't given yourself a raise. Mm -hmm. And this is the only way to do it. Man, so, Netflix gave themselves a raise. Oh my God. Amazon just gave themselves a raise. They just raised the, the cost of prime. I, I guess they have found that it's not enough. They, they haven't found enough yet. Yes, exactly. Oh, yeah. And then that is true. What is wor worth it to your time and preparation? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes, especially for the floor rates. And when it comes to working with clients, the thing is, you can make up these arbitrary rules, and it's easier to start raising your rates with new clients first. Mm -hmm. And then you can go back and raise your rates with existing clients. The thing with existing clients is you tell them what your current rate is now, but you also, you know, give them a little bit of a relationship discount. And mm -hmm. I think that's what we do with all of our existing clients in general. So giving yourself these arbitrary rules every time you hit a certain number of clients, every two to three months, when you have to say no to a gig, right? That means it's probably time to raise your rates. Really, anytime you start feeling comfortable talking about what your rates are, that's when it's time to raise them. Well, another thing that you can do, and I think you should do, uh, I'm going to give a framework of big companies doing this in a bad way, but give yourself less stuff to do. If it's difficult to raise the rates or raise the rates significantly enough, take away when you first are starting off with your business, you know, like thinking about brunch and budget when you're like, oh yeah, I'll take you out to brunch. We'll do all of yeah. this stuff. But as you got more in depth and more clients, you needed to have, you know, more control God, over your it's time. It's so true. My first brunches were like two or three hours long, y'all. I was doing everything. And then it went to an hour long brunch mm -hmm. and now they're 30 minutes. And this is a way that you're kind of raising your rates as well. So you're giving yourself less stuff to do. I just read this article about all these companies who are just shrinking the size of their products and keeping the prices the same. Shrinkflation, right? Yep, yep. Now let's talk about imposter syndrome because this is where yes. it gets really hard to advocate for yourself, whether you're asking for a raise at a job or whether you're trying to raise your rates with clients, right? I just, no, kind of no matter who you are in America, um, other countries too, but I'm pretty familiar with how America does this. You have been told that you're not enough that you're not worth it, that you should not ask for more because you're not worthy of more. You don't deserve, you know, even the word deserve itself implies that we're just not intrinsically good enough people to be able to get this stuff. And anytime we make an achievement, we feel the imposter syndrome of, can we get it again? Yeah. Anytime we get rejected, we feel the imposter syndrome of, oh, they're right. I am an imposter. I'm not good enough. 
anytime we're even heavily stressed, our emotions play so much into these things. Imposter syndrome is a put upon phobia, stress, fear reaction that we now have decided is a part of us and we continuously fight with. Yeah. So how do we work through it, right? And the way to work through it is to find community, is to find that money buddy. Role play with a friend and practice talking through asking for a raise or increasing your rates, right? I I like that you said role play. I'm picturing them with like the dice. (laughs) I mean, if you need to do it like that, that's cool. Like LARP LARP, um, asking for (laughs) a raise. Roll that natural 20, right? So, so yeah. and develop a coping mechanism for when you know you'll feel it coming on. Yeah, that's the thing that's difficult too, is imposter syndrome comes at times where you don't expect it. And so what can you do in that moment to acknowledge it and to say, okay, but I still need to keep moving forward. Okay, so this leads us into the next one. Yes. Yeah, so what are you the most anxious about, right? What is the worst that could happen? And this is especially for all my complicators in the room because we're really good at coming up with worst case scenarios. What is the worst that could happen? And how likely is it that it's actually going to happen? I remember when I was 11 or 12 and I wanted to ask somebody out, saw somebody in the window, thought <laughs> yeah. they were cute. And I told Mama Lect, and this is funny, um, uh, telling opposite Mama Lect advocacy stories. And I wanted to ask them out and I didn't ask them out. And I was like, I, I talked to my mom about it. I was like, and she was like, well, what are they gonna do? They gonna shoot you? And I was like, probably not. And I was like, well, it's the not, worst that could happen. Like, that's the worst that could happen, right? And she was like, if they stab, you can like dodge. But if they <laughs> shoot you, that's probably you're behind. Those things move really fast, right? <laughs> so like, if that, that could do that, then go ahead with it. Yeah. You know, I this brings that. us to what we're trying to say at the end. If you're still afraid to raise your rates, stick to the arbitrary thing that you made up. Yeah. You've got this thing. You already made a plan for it. You know, you can say it. If you blurt it out and you say it weirdly and they say, no, well, fine. then that leaves you in the place that you were before. Yeah, exactly. So this is why it's really important to have those rules in place when you feel like you're in a calm place to come up with them. These rules are in place for you and they are arbitrary, but you made them up because they make sense to you. These rules are in place for these moments where you come up and you have to actually raise your rates, when you actually have to say no to a client, when you actually have to figure out how to make this gig work, right? You know, and uh, we've got the little in and out thing where it says double it in the side. I want to say where that comes from. This goes as a shout out to all my aunts and uncles who were told that and believed that they had to do twice as much work for half the pay. We're going to stop doing that in 2022 and beyond. So when you do twice as work, you take the amount of work, amount of money that you should be paid and you double it. When you are setting your rates for something that you're starting and you know that you devalue your own work, take that rate and double it. When you're looking to negotiate your salary and you know that the amount that you're getting a raise by is less than it should be, you take that number and you double it. Yes. You try and ask for a 5% raise, ask for a 10% raise. Maybe they'll say no. Maybe they were going to say no. Maybe you'll find out that they're at capacity. Maybe you'll find out that they don't value you. Or maybe you'll find out they do. Maybe you'll get that 10% raise yeah so here's another brunch bite so if you devalue your work people would value theirs too your value this is like when we talk about this stuff it's not that your worth like know your worth Mm -hmm. know the worth of your work because we are immeasurable but our work has value this is like that jay-z song i think i might have said this in one of these others i'm not a businessman i'm a business man no you're you're a business you're a business person you're not a, a, a business you're a proprietor So your work has value and you get to set the rate of what these things are valued at. And to go back to what Dialect was saying about being a money monk is you're not just raising your rates for yourself. You're raising your rates for your family. You're raising your rates for your peers. You're raising your rates for, you're raising your rates for the person coming up behind you Mm -hmm. and making sure that they get paid for the work that they're doing in the same way that you're trying to make sure you're getting paid. Every time we ask for a raise and get it, we make it easier for the person behind us to also get paid what their work is worth. I don't care if you're a flamenco dancer or a paralegal or anything in between. The people that you work with, your community, your peoples, if you don't take more, then they won't get more and it'll die. Yeah. So feel free to share in the chat. It's a good peer pressure. So when are you going to negotiate your next raise or raise your rates? You know, it's fun. We've done this workshop at uh, offices and we've seen folks like look (laughs) over at the boss, be like, well, like, well, watch out. (laughs) But on the real set a date. Uh, If you're not sure when today set a date to set the date, figure out a time. Two months from now. I love it. 
Because again, we got to set these plans so we can make them happen. And two months is such a great amount of time to start having that pre-raised conversation, gathering your evidence, figuring out what your accomplishments are, figuring out how much you want to ask for, and also practicing and doing that market research. So I love that. Oh, this is great. Next time someone asks for that keynote or guest lecture, that's right. Yes. yes, the next client. That's so good. I love it. 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 That's great, y'all. All right. So uh, oh, we're getting out of yes. here in a second. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Look, I love this. Hi, I'm a professor and I've been told to that to negotiate a raise, I have to get a job offer from a different institution. Ooh. That is a lot of work, work that takes away from my other income of being a fine artist. Wow. Yeah. That's interesting. We've, um, I mean, I have a couple of clients who are professors and they have been able to ask for raises without having to get an offer from a different institution. You might not get as much of a raise as you're looking for, but I have definitely had clients or professors who have asked for a raise every year without having an offer from another institution. Yeah. And you Ooh, know, I like that. But I, yeah, I see yeah. Anne just saying, well, negotiate the fine artist part. I mean, I think, mm-hmm. again, this goes into the being enough thing and the thinking about how you put together your whole life and career. If you're cool with the position you got at the university and you're like, okay, I got to d- jump through these extra hoops to right. get these raises and that's fine with you. Cool. And then you can focus on how can I make more with the art part? Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. But again, if you're looking at that as like, if this is just one of many things that they're doing that is messing with the way you live your life. Yeah. And I don't know, Holly, if the if the university that you're working at told that to you or if it was just like other colleagues that mentioned that to you. So I'm not totally sure. And if that's the case where you feel stuck, maybe it does make sense to look elsewhere at a university yeah. that is fair to their professors and does give them raises because they're not afraid, not because they're afraid they're going to leave, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. as long as you're, you know, flirting with these other colleges anyway, who are like, oh, let me tender you an offer. Yeah. And I love this too from Angela, multiple streams of income can be negotiated differently. Mm-hmm. Yes, I love that. Pricing your work, pricing your extra income that's not your main income differently. That's why asking for a raise and raising your rates are part of the same conversation for so many of us because we have multiple streams of income. Yeah, you know, uh, I'm a writer and an educator as well, a creative and an educator. And uh, my creative work, the different types of creative work all have their enoughs. And none of them by themselves are meant to sustain everything. So I get the enough for each of them. Well, I love this also. Public institutions have set pay rates and they are public too. Yes. That's yes. right. Yeah, yeah. Those up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's often percentages that they're allowed to increase depending on where you're at too. Yeah. We're here for a few more minutes. So we're happy to answer any questions, but we'll get on out of your way with the slides. One thing I wanted to share, our education company, Pockets Change, we have opened up our next Hip Hop Fin Fest. We have a context for high school and junior high kids to make rap songs about personal finance. If you go to hiphopfinfest.com, we have lessons where you can download, beats for kids to download, and they can put together some great songs. So if you are working with high school or junior high students, uh, feel free to pass this information on to them. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's going to be a great party. By the way, Brunch and Budget, how we do our thing. There are free ways to reach us through the podcast. We have the Sea Change Financial Group Online Coaching for People of Color, Nudge, the three-month financial planning and advocacy quit start, and Budge, a 12-month financial planning coaching yes. and advocacy program where they yeah. show you how to do it. Again, remember that personal finance is a revolutionary act. We're not saying that these things will break the shackles that we are all under, but it will show us what we're doing how we feel and give us the presence and freedom to be able to decide whether we're going to change the game or get out of it entirely. Yes. Thank you all so much. This is how to contact us. And next week is our workshop on financial legacy. Legacy, legacy. Thank y'all so much. Thank y'all so much. Yes. Everybody who's been here with us for the last few to really appreciate y'all going through on this journey. Remember, we're happy to answer any questions before we get on out of here. And next week, we'll be doing the last John. This has been great. Thank you so much. I am taking notes. <laughs> uh, we can't wait for uh, the last workshop next week, Financial Legacy. Please send me that Hip Hop Fin Fest 
Pockets change. Uh, can you send that to me in an email? Let's yes. try to further amplify this work to our, our, our high school students. You know, Brookdale Community College, we have our relationship with our high school students. Looking forward. Listen, it's not too late to join everyone on this call. Share this with your family and your loved ones. Brought your budget. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. All right, so we don't have a DJ to ride us out, so we're going to get it out your way. Thank you so much. Have a great night, y'all. Play, play a good tune for yourself. Treat yourself. You did well. <laughs>